Welcome to today's session uh, as part of the Royal Television Society Futures Virtual Careers Fair uh, with thank you to our headline sponsor NFTS and bronze sponsor IMG Studios. Um, we're lucky today to have uh, the team from Silent Witness, uh, BBC's uh, very popular show uh, now filming its 24th season. Uh, in fact, it's celebrating uh, its 25th, 25th anniversary very shortly. It's a hugely popular show, uh, which regularly attracts audiences of 8 million or more, um, and has a, an incredibly hardworking and dedicated team making the production. Uh, obviously, it's been a challenging year for everyone with COVID, um, and uh, the team have had to adapt uh, with all that that requires. Uh, to make the show uh, and to continue filming. So today uh, we have uh, a wonderful team um, uh, who've joined us. Uh, I really also just wanted to outline what I hope the sort of the goals of some of this talk. Uh, one of the things I think is so important to demonstrate uh, to young and inspiring talent who want to join the industry are the wide, wide range of roles that are available. Um, working in the costume department, the makeup department, art department, uh, locations, finance, the budgeting side of things, hugely important to keep us all on track. Um, Post-production areas with editing, uh, obviously there's the writing and the acting and all those other elements as well as directing and producing. So I really wanted to explore the kind of range of roles um, and we have some other people on the panel who can talk about that. Um, how people sort of enter the industry uh, and what their aspirations are. But also I think what's really wonderful, what makes television filmmaking so special is the teamwork and how we all interconnect with each other, rely on each other, support each other to, to make television happen, to complete a day, to bring something to life. Um, everyone works incredibly hard and feels very passionate about what they do and, and hopefully that will come across to you today as well. Um, so first and foremost, I really wanted to introduce the panel uh, to you. Uh, we have uh, Nick uh, Lambon, who is the producer on Silent Witness, doing an, a tremendous juggling job um, at the moment as we have uh, episodes that are being filmed, episodes that are in prep, um, and episodes that are in post-production in the edit. Uh, so he's juggling a huge amount. We also have David with us, who is a script researcher uh, and he can tell you more about how he works within the uh, editing, uh, writing department, uh, working closely with writers, with Nick and, and other members of the team. Um, we also have Celine, who's with us today, who's an assistant production coordinator, uh, an absolutely key role uh, in the whole process. Uh, without their uh, diligent hard work, I'm sure a whole production would fall apart. Um, and hoping to have, join us a little bit later, if at all possible, is Ollie, who's one of our production buyers who works in the art department. So just to start off, I wondered if you would mind individually just telling us a little bit about how you started in the industry, what your sort of first couple of jobs were, your entry job, um, and also what it is you actually do on the show. Nick, if you don't mind starting off. Sure. Um... Well, my first job in television was for a distribution company uh, that sold the rights to television around the world. Um, and my job was to read the scripts or watch the content that they had and write the synopsis. So uh, it wasn't a very glamorous job at all. Uh, it was more marketing and publicity. Um, but I think that's what first got me interested in looking at scripts and uh, reading stories. And that's sort of my background, really. Uh, I've come up through script editing and being a story producer. And this is my first job this year as the producer of uh, high-end TV drama. Uh, so as the producer, I'm responsible for the whole production, really, and bringing together uh, the different departments that um, we need to put together uh, and also uh, producing the scripts and the story uh, and then bringing those two elements together to, so that we can so we can film it really uh, which uh, is no mean feat at the best of times and uh, is definitely uh, even more challenging at the moment but um, yeah I suppose my background is it comes from editorial uh, and I find that that is an incredibly helpful 
uh, background for the job that I'm doing now. Great, thank you. Um, David, uh, please tell us how you, how you started uh, and, and what it is exactly you do, do on the show. So I started as a trainee researcher and a great entry level scheme at Sky, which just allowed me to learn all about, you know, all about how TV is made and even I can produce a short documentary. And after that, I got a placement in the Sky Drama Department as an intern and just learned all about script reading and how stories work. And then funny enough, after that, my first role, my first proper role was as a script trainee on Sign a Witness. Uh, where I got to learn all about how the script department worked and all about amends and how they put together the stories. And then about a year later, after having lots of odd drama jobs, such as script reader and writer's room runner and things like that, I got an email asking to come and return as a script researcher, which was really great and which leads me to sitting here now. And as a script researcher, I suppose my main role is to help make the scripts as authentic as possible which mainly involves answering questions from the writers who sometimes ask, what would this particular scientific test be? Or they're trying to solve a plot hole. And I also talk to various experts such as forensic scientists and pathologists, and I turn their feedback on the scripts into actionable notes for the writers to really implement into their stories and make the stories as authentic and, and real as possible. This also involves a lot of Googling too, where I have to figure out lots of different facts um, yeah, and part of my role also, there's quite a bit of interconnectivity, uh, which involves the art department mainly, such as helping to write newspaper articles as props, or help trying to explain the scientific techniques and what exact um, machine or piece of equipment they would use. Wonderful, thank you. That's really helpful, <laughs> really clear. Um, Celine, uh, tell us, how, how did you start and what is it exactly that you do on Silent Winners? Um, so I come from a fashion background, so I studied fashion and then I got onto the costume department and I somehow made my way through uh, set from costume to art department to production, which is where I am now. Um, and as an assistant coordinator, I guess it's, it's about supporting the coordinator um, and it also varies from one job to another. So a coordinator on one job could be an APOC on another depending on the sort of scale of the program and everything. So it's mainly sort of dealing with cast members and making sure they're fine, that they get on set when they need to, um, accommodation, and just gathering people and making sure all departments are sort of talking to each other. And um, yeah, anything that basically comes up on set somehow comes down to us and then um, we solve it with problem solvers, I guess. Um, so yeah, um, I should probably mention that I did actually do a course at the NFTS, which was very, very useful in production, which also helped me um, getting where I am. Um, so yeah. That's very Thanks. useful. Thank you. Thank you. Good to mention the NFTS actually and the roles that these courses can play. Um, just, I just wanted before before we go on. I, I just also wanted to talk a little bit about why you what you think is special about Silent Witness. Um, what makes it because it really is quite unique in many ways in terms of you know it's been running a long time and it's an incredible operation and and, and works I have to say remar remarkably well, uh, which a lot of it is down to your incredible hard work. But but Nick, if you don't mind just talking a little bit about what you, what you think makes Silent Witness special. Um. Gosh, uh, it is it is a huge, hugely successful program, and I think what's uh, I think one of its great skills is its ability to adapt and to be different, and it, and it's not uniform. I don't think you can run for twenty five years if you can't keep telling very different stories. Some not just across the years, but within series. I mean, we talk a lot, uh, the executive producer and I, about it being a collection of stories rather than just a homogenous series, you know, and, and it, I think what's brilliant about it, I mean, another show I've done, weirdly, this is the closest I've got to working on. These two shows are very uh, similar, which is Doctor Who, because this is one of the few long running shows where you aren't given very much beyond the initial set of the Lyle and a couple of characters and then everything else you have to create for that story. 
Um, and I think what the audience loves is that they're spending all this time with these two or three characters who they're getting to know and that they're falling in love with and, you know, they're seeing all their mistakes and triumphs, but also they're getting to go to these new worlds all the time and meet all these exciting new characters and they get a sense of closure you know you can binge watch silent witness and, and you can see five six seven different stories rise up and fall down all at the same time and I, I think that's that's actually a rare it's a rare opportunity to have that space that two hour slot to be able to keep doing unique dramatic stories in prime time now so mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really great. Yeah, no, it, it definitely has that authenticity and, uh, you know, the, the attention to detail and the accuracy, some of what, you know, David was talking about um, earlier. I, I, think it, I think it's also, and we know this from, you know, what the audience says to us, uh, you know, they, they are really interested and fascinated in the, the authenticity, the scientific world our characters occupy, because mm. I think there are a lot of procedural dramas, but Silent Witness, certainly on British television sort of still stands apart for representing you know uh, a, a part of the investigative process that we don't get to see very often and mm -hmm. that makes the storytelling sometimes quite difficult but it also gives you a unique perspective on mm -hmm. uh, on the different uh, uh, crimes or characters that we're looking at and I think that's uh, that's definitely that's inspiring to some people I think to see how clever i mean i'm learning all the time the incredible things that these people in real life can genuinely do you know and i think that's you know and david is constantly producing documents that make me go really you know that's i think that's uh yeah that's also really exciting for people to watch they feel like they're learning something from it and i and i agree with you i mean every every single job i've done and i'm sure it'd be the same for all of you guys you are constantly learning both from an editorial point of view and the script side of working with different talent the subject matter but also about how you put a show together uh, there are always different challenges and uh, and we'll come on to that sort of scenario playing part of it in a moment david i just wanted to ask you another question um, just to dig in a little bit more into your role. So you've explained some of the aspects that you do, but 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 also I wanted to look into some of the more creative side of what you do, because, you know, you'll probably also have an opportunity to pitch some ideas once you've done your research, when you're talking to writers, when you're talking to Nick. I just wanted to understand that a little bit more. So in my role, a lot of the ideas come from the advisors who are really great and think about all the different things. So if if there's an issue in the script, they may think that, oh yeah, this potential plot line, it wouldn't quite happen like this in reality. How about we do this? And I would say work with the professional and figure out a solution to, to, to really help. And I think also there's some of the ideas which are problems which potentially the advisor can't really figure out a solution actually helps us on a character basis. So, things which they may point out, which, oh, a real pathologist may not do, or things like that. We can really, really question if our characters would do that and why they would do that. And it really helps inform us and inform the characters to show when they may be, say, you know, maybe taking a little bit more time than usual, taking less time to do something. And it can add some great twists some great mysteries mm -hmm. and some really great character depth too. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the twists and turns and the, that creative process that I all think is so fascinating and certainly you're, you're providing a lot of ideas and, and uh, you know, thought into that as well. And, and Celine, I, also I, I would imagine your every day is different. Um, there are always different challenges that are thrown at you. Um, how, how does that feel? How does it, what's a sort of, you know, uh, what's the atmosphere like? I'm sure it, you know, it has quite a kind of buzzy atmosphere, a lot of energy. Um, yeah, I, I guess it, you can never plan so much. Like we, we can we can only plan. Obviously, we do plan, but there's always something coming up that we wouldn't expect. Um, but yeah, I guess that's what keeps it sort of nice. It's like being on your toes constantly and just sort of trying to catch whatever's coming your way. Um, yeah. Um, so one of the things I wanted to move on to was to do a bit of what I call sort of scenario playing. 
And this is something that we do every day when we're working on a show, because as, as Celine said, however much you plan, and there is a huge amount of planning that goes on to make a show from everyone, things always come up, things always go wrong, <laughs> changes are always happening. Um, and then it's a question of, of how, of who does what and how a team works together. Um, and how, what I also really want to demonstrate is how everyone is important. Everyone plays a role. It's not just about the director or the producer or the lead actor. It's about so many other people behind the scenes who are really making it happen. Um, so I'm going to pitch some scenarios to our silent witness panel um, and see what they come back with. Um, if also, by the way, those who are, are watching and listening have any questions, by the way, please do post them because uh, there is 10 minutes at the end uh, for me to ask uh, some of these questions. So just have a think about any questions you may have. So, um, as I said, on a day to day basis, things happen, things can go wrong. Um, and uh, very quickly, one has to respond and come up with solutions. It's create, coming up with creative solutions is something that's been mentioned by everyone on this panel. So let me just pitch some ideas to you and tell me how you might resolve this problem. So you have, um, a, lead, you have a, a scene on a beach. Uh, it's something you've been planning for ages. It's a big setup, uh, integral to the to the script. Really, really important. And each day, production, Celine, Nick, you know, other people are checking the weather forecast because it's meant to be a beautiful sunny day. But it ha being shot in the UK, of course, weather is highly unpredictable. And two days before filming, uh, the team realizes a storm's coming and it's going to look bad. What are they going to do? So what I wanted to pitch to Nick is that situation. I know you have filmed on a beach recently without going into too many details. Um, but what I wanted to ask you is sort of what, what do you do when you hear news like that? Who do you bring in? What are your ABC solutions as to how you might resolve such a problem? Um, well, I think there's quite a few departments in that scenario that you need to start talking to. I mean, some of them are obvious, like locations. Uh, it's about, you know, it sounds like if the weather's going to be absolutely torrential and that has actually happened to us on this shoot many times I got soaked this morning by the way going to a location so uh they um I think that the first you know it sounds like you're probably looking at trying to move when you're going to shoot those beach scenes and and if that's the case you know you've got two things at play you've got where can we where is it going to be suitable when is it going to be available to us to film on that beach again but also what's going to go in its place if we're filming in that beach on that beach on thursday and we can't film there what is it we're going to do instead and you know on this show that might mean that we want to use our studio space because we know we have access to that space and it's going to be inside and it's dry and it, it's something to bring forward but as soon as you start to play with your planned schedule, it's slightly more complicated than just saying, oh, well, we'll go over there because we've got it. Because immediately that means I've probably, by bring, you think, oh, I've brought forward only by a couple of days, a few scenes in the Lyle, everyone can sit around a table and they can talk about the, the simple scene. But uh, I know David's kind of nodding in the background. It, it means that art department for example I've probably just brought forward six seven eight graphics that they need for those scenes that I that weren't they didn't need to be ready for another couple of weeks and now they need to be ready in two days you know uh, it's also about actor availability the actors that I need on the beach might not be the same actors for the scenes that I'm moving around on that day and similarly I need to know when I am filming the beach whether those actors I need are going to be available then too um, so it, funnily enough, the people on this call uh, are two very, very useful people to have because, you know, David is, is uh, across, you know, what uh, various kind of props and graphics and things are going on with the art department and is helping them to get those ready. But Celine, as part of the production office, is kind of the first place I would run to really and say, you know, uh, what do we do we know what these actors availability is do we know you know I'd be I'd be wanting to know where the line producer is because he's probably out and about and very busy and talk to him about what our options are with the production manager um, I guess you're trying to formulate 
at least one, probably two alternative plans all the time, because I, I think that's how you have to, you have to be ready for your plan A to go wrong. And then also maybe sometimes if you're very unlucky, your plan B as well. Um, yeah. So I think in that scenario, you are, what you want to do as quickly as possible is, is have an opportunity to gather people together, heads of department from say the art department locations, talking to people in the production office and, and just see what, what your options are really. Can we move this scene? Can we do that? Because the last thing you want to do, what you're trying to avoid, I think at all times is stopping. That you, what you might, what you, what you absolutely don't want to do under any circumstances, unless you're absolutely, there's no alternative, is to just go. Oh well, uh, we can't film on the beach on Thursday, so let's just not film anything on Thursday because that's when it, lots of people are sitting around and they don't get paid, or it costs us lots of money, and that's a real struggle. So you're always looking for a way, I guess, to keep going. That's the mm -hmm. main thing that's going on in your head. What can we do to help us so that we can still complete on time and we mm -hmm. can. Still get something useful out of that day because mm. you know sometimes you have very little notice you know because of various factors sometimes you might have to pull something on the day I mean that's mm -hmm. but you don't want you still don't want to waste that day you don't want to lose that day you want to still make that as productive as you can so yeah. Yeah. you're absolutely right and everyone's got deadlines they've got to hit you know we always have to deliver this show at a particular time to a channel so you've got various deadlines so okay so we're in this scenario uh you're going to ring celine up yeah. and say sorry we've made a decision we're pulling thursday off the beach celine what do you do what are the first two things you do and who do you then reach out to and tell accommodation i'm just like i have to literally rebook everything um so rebooking transport for most of our cast i mean our cast can be based literally anywhere in the UK. So after making sure they're available or yeah, as to making sure they're available is getting them there um, from wherever they come from, which can be from once again, anywhere. And then COVID times also is um, different than it used to be. Um, but then, yeah, just making sure they all have somewhere to, to sleep. Um, and then, yeah, then I guess it would be our line producer about so what cast are contracted under and uh, whether we can actually move them. And um, yeah, that would take me enough time that I think that's what I would focus on to start with. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. And, and absolutely key. <laughs> key, key, again, demonstrating that your role is absolutely essential in the process, because if we don't get those cast on that day, uh, you know, the new new allotted day there on set, on time, we won't be able to shoot and, uh, and that causes massive problems for the production. So absolutely integral to the whole process. David, you get the call from Nick to say, sorry, mate, uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna shoot on Thursday. It's now gonna be Tuesday, uh, whichever way round it is. Uh, what do you then do? What's your first, who do you then reach out to? Um, I guess if that happened, it would be looking at what scenes are changed because as Nick was saying, as we've got the Lyle space, generally those are the type of scenes which replace it. And at times that can be putting scenes which were about three weeks, four weeks in to shooting the next, like in the next two days. And therefore you just have to look at what is needed in that scene. And whether that be say like a, a medical record of scene on screen and therefore it needs to be written up and that has to be accurate. So it needs to be put there. So it'd be prioritizing what would be seen on screen first and what would really be shown to the audience. And they'd know if it's just, you know, like, you know, just copy and paste it from like a, I don't know, like a recipe or something like that. When they know it's not real. Um, and then focusing on the parts which are maybe seen on screen, but not as important, such as, you know, something which is on a desk. Um, and then also just ensuring the accuracy because sometimes some of the scenes may need to change just because if we're not at the beach, if this is throwing another span in the work, if we're not able to film at the beach entirely, there may be continuity checks, which you need to check in the script too, which may be, I don't know, the character mentions that their favorite place is a beach and that's where they always go when they, they want to go there. And therefore, if it's not at that beach, particularly we'd have to look back at all the different references and change them to whatever the eventual new location could become. Yeah, very, very good point. Continuity is absolutely key in the script process to make sure that um, 
there, there are no bumps in the storyline. Really important point there. And, and on to Ollie. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. I know you're incredibly busy because we are filming uh, every day at the moment. Um, so thank you very much. Um, do you want to just, Ollie, if you don't mind, just tell, tell everyone briefly what it is you do on the show and how you started? Oh, can't hear you. Oh. Hello. We were so close. We were so close. He's, he's muted, but I don't know if he can unmute himself. Hello. Hey. I had the wrong button pressed. That's right. I'm not very good at Zoom. Um, so I do the props and the set dressing, I guess, mainly. Um, and I started, I went to film school and then through work experience and placements and then working up through the art department, I guess, from assistant upwards. Um, yeah, and what was the other question? Oh, uh, so yeah, so it's really just how you started and what it is you, you do on the show and um, uh, what we've done, uh, uh, Ollie, as you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier that we were going to do some scenario playing. Yeah. So I gave Nick the wonderful challenge of the fact that you were going to shoot on a beach. Uh, mm -hmm. They checked the weather and of course the storm was coming. And so they're going to have to reconfigure pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and uh, so David and Celine have, have told us uh, what they do, what, what happens when Nick gives them the call to say, sorry, guys, we're going to have to figure stuff. But now what, what David uh, has explained is that one of the people he will be calling is the art department. Uh, you know, is someone like you to say, Ollie, heads up. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard that we're going to shift days around. Um, so it's really the point of this is really to demonstrate the kind of the teamwork and how you all work so brilliantly together as a team and, in, and the way that you're all interconnected. Um, you know, you know, you desperately always need that up to date information to be able to react to changes which are happening on a daily basis. So David's just rang you up and give you the heads up. The scenes on the beach aren't happening. Yeah, um, they're either going to move to the Lyle. So he's looking at whether he's going to rewrite them. Um, and or uh, they're moving to the you thought they were in three weeks time and they're now happening on Thursday yeah what do you do okay uh, we would check to see what props are needed for those scenes and what dressing and we would obviously need to know what script changes there were and then we'd have to juggle around our priorities of what prop we need to get when um, try and speed up any makes if they're being made um, which the uh, prop makers love, <laughs> and um, and yeah, just swap our shopping lists around, I guess, and our hires. We'd have to change a lot of our hire periods and a lot of paperwork. Mm. But um, yeah, <laughs> so there is quite a lot of priorities around, I yeah. guess, from what dates yeah. we need things and checking, communicating what we can and wouldn't be able to provide in that amount of time mm, 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 mm. yeah yeah speed is is absolutely key and being really on it but also i think what's important is kind of really owning your job you have a very responsible everyone plays a very key role in the process i think that's one of the things to sort of remind people it's not just as i said all about the director um much as they're important to the process as well um i, mean, I, want, um, I wonder if um there's i know because you've seen this in action caroline when you mm. first came to the set but like because of the people who are here we have something which we call a pathology rehearsal which is sort mm. of what it sounds like uh which um is an opportunity for uh the cast mainly but also key members of the crew a lot of whom are here to uh, come together with the onset pathologist and just practice and come to understand and learn all the terminology that are involved in our post-mortem scenes, which are obviously like they're big set pieces of every single episode. And they're also really technical and complicated. And when you're committed to accuracy, you know, Emilia Fox, uh, who's obviously been in the show a long time, is absolutely committed to wanting to look and sound and make it feel like a real pathologist is doing these scenes. And so, but that rehearsal is a really good example of all of us working together as best we can and different people can talk about what that means but it, it certainly for me it, it's a it's where we uh we have just the scenes that we're going to be doing in the mortuary and then we just talk through with our on-set pathologist with the people from art department with david 
uh, what the scene might mean sometimes, because sometimes it's very technical language. What it is, what, what is it, we're, what's the meaning of what we're trying to say? What are we trying to show the audience? And then with makeup, with costume, with Ollie, it's about what props do we need? What will we see on that body? How does that work? And uh, I mean, David can talk more about it, but it's quite a complicated process. because also we have to find time to do that while we're filming. So we have to make time for everyone to stop what they're doing and come down. And we actually practice it on the set, which is really interesting. And we all stand there together with our scripts and try and work out and it, it often leads to lots of little tweaks and changes and thoughts because someone will say, oh, actually, it's very, very difficult for us to show that or oh, we're not sure that's quite right or I'd like to say it in a different way. And that's quite a good example of quite a lot of different departments who don't always interact kind of gathered around one table uh, during filming. I don't know. I think, David, David, it, it, it's quite involved for you, isn't it, pathology rehearsal, really? Yeah, so with a pathology rehearsal, we often go through the script a second time because we, we, we do the pathology research really in depth. And then in the pathology rehearsal, we, you may find out that, say, an actor wants to move from the head to the shoulder instead of the head to the feet, which is written down and then figuring out a solution as to how and why the character would do that and keep it in the, in the same space as, as a, what a real pathologist would do. And sometimes, as, as Nick was saying, that sometimes you do realize that, okay, this prop, which we need to show a specific part of the body being cut open is, is, is very difficult to make. So what's the solution to, to changing that and making sure that we can see something on screen, which has the exact same meaning as the really complicated prop and still gets across um, to the audience, this is how someone potentially was murdered or this is what the finding is without completely rewriting the script for it. And I, and I know that I, I'm guilty of this. I drive Ollie and people in his department mad by putting things into the script that then uh, are very, very difficult to obtain or we have some sort of branding. Pro there's, there's only one X-ray machine in existence and I've asked to put it on the set and it creates all sorts of problems. But um, we've had some weird and wonderful new technology in the Lyle this year, Ollie, and I guess I, I guess maybe it's worth talking about because it's linked to, it's all, often all our science and our lie on our lab scenes. It, it, it's about how we go about finding new things we haven't done before, I guess, is what uh, is always the challenge, isn't it? So I don't know if you want to talk, oh, there's lots of examples of things we've done this year, which I know we haven't seen for a while. And we've, we've, we have lots of head scratching meetings where we work out whether that version is going to let us get away with it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's quite a process sometimes because I'm obviously not, not a forensic scientist. Um, so just trying to work out what everything is a lot of the time um, is half the work. But um, David usually provides me with a great little document with all the um, um, advisors notes and stuff on. So and I usually send David about a million emails before I managed to work out what something is um, and the advisors as well actually um, and then a lot of it is contacting companies that actually make the equipment or people who work with it and just trying to find a way of borrowing or loaning or hiring or whatever way we can to get it to get it on set really but usually with an advisor as well so that we know um that we're using it right <laughs> we're not got it upside down or something so. yeah um, no i are we you're very very resourceful at finding things that we uh we it's easy to write it into a script but it's much much harder to get it there on the day and get it working um and i think celine those kind of meetings we have they're quite logistically challenging because we often have to squeeze them in around someone else is filming the someone's filming something all their HODs are very busy we, it, it's kind of we I think those are the sometimes the they're the most important and they're the hardest things to make work in our schedules don't you think yeah so I think it's like generally getting everyone together it's always a challenge anyway um but also I'm thinking scripts amendments. That's the first thing that came to mind is that usually <laughs> after these meetings, 
obviously some changes are going to happen, which means for the production office, sort of receiving these changes and distributing it to everyone. And obviously everyone wants them as soon as possible, but it's also a challenge to get them done on time and as quickly as possible. And also sort of catching ahead of time, which scenes are affected by these, these changes. Because that, that could be scenes that we're shooting like two days later, um, which would change, could change cast again, could change um, like the order of we want to shoot things. So um, I'm always thinking script amends, like that's what I go with these <laughs> rehearsals in my head, but yeah. Mm. Um, and getting everyone together, obviously. But that's just a matter of reaching out to everyone and communication and just, the earlier we know the better really communication is absolutely key it sounds so obvious but it is really 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 important um and, and speed as well um we often have to react incredibly quickly um i'm conscious of the time does it if anyone as i said has any questions and wants to to send them through on the chat bar uh to ask any specific anything specific or uh, anything about the roles that these people play or any other roles um, that you're interested in pursuing, um, you know, please, please do write them up and, and, and we can ask. Um, I just want to say, th maybe throw, you know, one other scenario briefly um, at you guys. Um, so uh, just, you know, lead actor um, is going to be late. It isn't going to, is, is ill or whatever. Um, and isn't going to make that day. What do you do? Oh, shall I start that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think it, it depends on what the scenes are that they're going to be shooting. I'm guessing that if it's the lead actor, most of those scenes, they're going to be fairly essential. Um, but it might be if you're very lucky or you're clever or you look at it, that there are some scenes or parts of scenes that we can do without them. Uh, which is always good because it means people could work on something that they've already prepped for that day and that might buy you a little bit of time at the start of the day because you might find out that person's ill at very very short notice so that might allow you to get going on a day while you work out what it is you're going to do it it probably means uh bringing some uh other scenes into that day or moving it around uh but like i say it might be that we need to very quickly and skillfully rewrite some scenes or or change what we think the content of that is do we really need to see him or her in the background do we really it would it be better if one of our other characters made that discovery or that so there are often uh creative ways around that um as well as the sim the not simple but what seems the simpler version which is just to say okay well we'll just move all these We'll do we'll do a completely different day um, because again you've got all the challenges of a beach which is how mm. we're not ready to do that day um, but I think I mean the others can talk about that I mean I think the other thing that you without wanting to pry into anyone's personal circumstances is in that moment you want to think ahead as well because you can scramble to cobble together a day and that's probably okay but you know if someone is going to be ill if it's Tuesday and your lead actor is going to be ill for the rest of the mm. week or there's a possibility, you want to look ahead and start thinking, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> mm. I don't want to be running around like this every day for the next yeah. four days. So it might be a slightly bigger rejig or a slightly mm. bigger rethink. Mm -hmm. or, you know, if it's if it's really extreme, you might even, you know, it wouldn't be one of our leads. But if it was a guest actor who just couldn't, come mm -hmm. and we might even have to recast that part you know yeah. to allow us to keep going uh but even then you'd need to build a little buffer into your schedule of scenes sure. that you can do without them so, yeah. yeah as you can see uh people who are watching uh nick's already come up with his five different options and solutions, <laughs> which is quite brilliant because that's exactly what we all have to do well, um, the questions it. popped up which i just would like to briefly uh if people give a brief answer on yeah. skills uh, what skills do you need to do your job uh, or did you, did you feel you had to have an or choir before you did your job? David, if you don't mind just giving a brief answer. Um, so skills, there's, there's obviously being rigorous and attention to, attention to detail, which I guess, I guess are traits which you can definitely learn. You just, you just realise whilst you're reading scripts, like this, this will affect production or this will be seen on screen. 
Um, I suppose also what, because my job is really with the advisors a lot of the time, I suppose a lot of the skills are sometimes actually soft skills in the sense that you have to be able to be at a place with them that you can call them up potentially at a random hour and asking them, oh, we've got this new scene filming tomorrow. Mm. Can you help us? And making sure that we get across clearly what the advisors say, because sometimes as they're the experts, sometimes it might not be comprehensible to the general population like me. Um, and so getting into a, a position where we can translate it and explain it to everyone is, is really useful and, and a, a very good skill you need to have. Yeah, thank you. That's really clear. People skills, really, really important. I absolutely agree with you. Um, just uh, on another point, uh, just to try and answer one, a couple of other questions briefly. Um, if uh, we were filming in a location uh, and we were having problems with permissions, um, just briefly, Nick, what would we do? What do you do with fans walking into shops, that kind of thing? Oh, well, uh obviously we try to go to locations where we have as much control as we possibly can so we want to keep uh we want to keep the public back uh, away from us and that might depending on what the location is that might mean we have to uh restrict or close access to certain roads or certain places uh and it's also about having people it's being clear people will respect what you're doing if you've got clear signage if you've got people standing somewhere and telling them what's going on and why you need their cooperation for a minute or two or to walk around a bit longer um and also yeah if it's about people walking backwards and forwards in shot i mean we try to avoid having too many uh public in the background we try to use our own essays and all of that stuff but it's also about catching people and uh, if, if you need release forms if you need permissions it's getting those permissions if you can up front and then also having people there to catch people as they're moving making people aware people are very if you put up a big sign that says we are filming here then people who don't want to be on camera will divert their way away so that's very helpful that's good. Yeah, no, it's it's always a challenge. Locations are a tricky balance. Um, Ollie, quick question for you. Um, yeah. How did you, uh, you talked about doing a, uh, I think you said the NFTS. So how did you start your way into the art department? Um, how did you originally get your foot in the door? Um, that was through, it was a lot of work experience, I guess. Um, and yeah, I came out of uni and I think I worked with one of my tutors or something or someone that I met through through somebody at uni um, just on a work experience basis and then did a couple more paid projects with them and then it's all sort of contact based um, once you start building up a list of people you work with I guess. Um, I, I, my I, my advice always to people is take that coffee. If anyone says yeah. let's go and have a coffee, or, or, or suggest can I can I buy you a coffee? I can't tell you how many coffees I've bought over the years um, <laughs> because you always want to get people's advice, and even today I still do it because um, you're always learning. So I, I agree. You know, grab any opportunity, have a go, see if that role is right for you. You know, as Celine has demonstrated brilliantly, I think. You know, you've worked in three different departments. Um, who knows where you're going to go next, you know, and that's again a wonderful thing about the industry that you can try lots of different areas in order to to grow. Um, I think we're coming to a point where I've got to sort of I ought to wrap up, um, but I just wanted to say thank you very, very much um, to everyone and, and thank you for for the questions. I've seen there've been a couple about COVID. Um, suffice to say, without going into too many details, it has been extraordinarily challenging. Um, this show went back into production in September, having been on hiatus. It was one of the first shows in the country to go back, uh, not the first, but one of, one of the first. Um, and it has done a remarkable, remarkable job um, at dealing with, with all the COVIDness of our, of our world, um, keeping going. And, and I have seen some assemblies of the new show and you wouldn't know it, it's quite extraordinary. Um, so I just want to say thank you very, very much uh, to our panel uh, for joining us and, and for being so open about the wonderful world. Um, I want to uh, thank our headline sponsor, 
uh, NFTS and the bronze sponsor IMG Studios. Um, I just want to remind uh, the people, the attendees, that there are 85 exhibitors who are looking forward to meeting you. Uh, we can talk about production and training. Uh, there are CV clinics available. Uh, there are other seminars, obviously, to attend. Um, and their production professionals who I'm sure will be around to, to help and support you. Uh, enjoy the rest of this event. It is a wonderful industry. You have to work hard, but you get so much back. Uh, I encourage all of you to pursue it. Take care and many thanks. <laughs>